was going to cost her. And part of it was she had uh, problems with her roof, where she couldn't put panels on her roof. And then we realized that she's not the only one, because actually 80% of us are locked out of the solar market because we cannot put solar on our own rooftop. And maybe we're renters, like a lot of people in this city. Maybe it's because there's a tree covering our roof, or our roof is facing the wrong way. But that means that we're locked out of the solar market, and thus solar savings. And the thing is, there's something out there called community solar. And that's what a lot of people are touting as the new solution. And community solar, has anyone heard of community solar, by the way? Awesome, cool. Not surprised. <laughs> um, so community solar is this new thing where you don't have to put anything on your rooftop. You can buy a portion of a neighborhood shared solar farm and switch to solar that way. So the electricity goes back to the grid, and then you as a participant see a credit show up on your monthly utility bill for the solar that you're enjoying from your share virtually. And most of these models are subscription models, so there's no upfront cost, and you're saving 10% or so off your electricity bill every single year. So no upfront cost, you don't need a roof. This is really the only way most of us can go solar, which is cool. This is a new industry. Uh, the Department of Energy is going to be a $16 billion industry by 2020. We anticipate our portion of that to be $2 billion. And that means that that's the amount of money that's going into building these farms just in the next few years. And every year that we've worked in it, it's doubled every year across the country. So now we have about 300 megawatts across the country. Four years ago, it was like 60. So it's getting really, really big. But there's still problems with getting people access to it, right? Like it says, how many people here have signed up for Community Solar? Raise your hand. Damn, really? <laughs> That's awesome. Let's, let's talk. <laughs> but in the of us haven't yet, right? And like no one has heard about it. No one knows what community solar is. And there are solar developers who are building solar farms, and there are hundreds of them out there, and they're really good at building and financing solar. So think of Solar City, Sunrun, uh, a number of Sun Edison, a number of companies you might recognize because they've gone bankrupt in the last year, but they're really good at building and putting solar into the ground. What they're not as good at is all the customer-facing stuff. So these projects don't get built until you line up the customers. But building solar farms and finding customers to do them at scale is an entirely different skill set. So what we do is we bring the two sides of the solar marketplace together. And we like to think, so people like Paula, like people like a lot of us in the room that can't do rooftop solar, we connect them to local solar farms in their area that they can benefit from and save money on their electricity bills. So we also have uh, software that allows us to connect people. So in a few months, we'll be launching our online marketplace where you can put in your zip code and see all the solar projects that are available to you in your area, which doesn't exist right now. Um, it also lets you see how your solar share is doing and you can tell your friends about it. And the cool thing about telling your friends about it is, so. Can you guys think of the number one reason why anyone signs up for solar now? Just in general, rooftop or otherwise? Save money. So they, why? So they want to save money. That's, that's one of them for sure. <laughs> Thank you for being literate. Uh, so the number, according to Yale, according to a study that you did, the number one reason why anyone signs up for solar is because they have a friend or a neighbor that went solar. So it kind of makes sense, right? Like in our day and age, we're all connected. We're all connect uh, Our social networks matter a lot to us. Solar is contagious amongst networks. And yet, there are, that's not how solar is sold. That's not how solar is offered to people. And there are two ways that solar is sold in this country. I'm going to ask you if you can guess. Is one of them leasing models? So that's, that's one model that people buy it. But like, how do people hear about solar? Oh, okay. Yeah. Churches. That would, that's not how they hear about it now. <laughs> but thanks for previewing our model. <laughs> okay, so the that solar is sold. One is I always show up to your house like a stranger. I roll up and I'm like, yo, buy solar from me. Don't worry, trust me. It's all good. And there's no reason for you to trust me because I'm a stranger. So door to door is one. The other is you're walking in Home Depot, minding your own business, looking for pipes or wood, and someone shouts at you and they're like, yo, buy solar from me. 
And so that's the second reason, the way people hear about solar. So those are the two ways solar is sold across this country, stranger to strangers, right? It makes no sense. And the reason why all these companies went bankrupt is because it cost them a lot of money to find each customer. It cost them $3,000 to $6,000 to find each of these customers. So our premise is that if solar is contagious, why don't we have an entire business model that spreads solar virally by tapping into these community networks? So places like churches, you get an early adopter and then you sign up the entire network. So an early adopter can be some of the churches we signed up in Massachusetts. And once the church signed up, and then once the preacher signed up, then the entire congregation signed up for their home. And we're working with Etsy to plug their, solar, uh, their headquarters in Brooklyn into a local solar farm. And we talk about what ways they can use their massive network and membership to plug households across the country into solar farms. And so you can get scalability, and you can lower your acquisition costs and spread solar to the masses doing this. Um, so just really quickly on our work, we've worked on uh, now 12 projects in Massachusetts and across the country. We're expanding to New York this quarter, which is super exciting. Uh, and we, <laughs> there's Etsy there. Look at that. <laughs> and we work, we work with another, um, Fortune 100, Fortune 20 retailer that we're just not allowed to announce yet, but to plug their distribution centers, that gives it away, into, <laughs> um, into local solar farms. Uh, and then uh, basically we work with the people who build the farms and connect them to entire communities that could benefit from it. Uh, this is part of our team. Uh, Echoing Green is really, really important to us. And the connection and the community is really, really important to us. It's more than just They've been more than just a funder. Uh, they've allowed us to learn a lot from the resources here. And we've also um, gotten other funding. And then <laughs> our goal is by you know, 2021. I think what's cool about this is it's not just a, it's not charity or just like a straight up um, for-profit model that's going to just, we, we're trying to create profit for the purpose of creating profit. What, what's cool about this is that there's a lot of value when you create the demand for this kind of solar. We don't have to build the farms to put more solar in the ground because we create the demand for it. And so that, that's really exciting. And you can, if you make it incredibly easy for people to sign up for solar, then they will sign up for solar. It's just that right now it's not easy. It's not accessible. And that's what's preventing people from signing up. Uh, this is our team. And I think the thing to talk about here is why we started Solstice in the first place. So my buddy and I, Steve, um, we were working on a project in, in, on my, solar microgrids in India. And we kind of realized that we didn't have to be halfway across the world to work on energy access issues that really mattered. Um, because here in America, there's a solar access problem. And I uh, watched my mom my entire life struggle to pay the bills. Like she was just, she was a single mom, raised three kids alone. and. Every month, it was a choice of, do I pay for the electricity bill? Do I pay rent? Like, she had to make these hard choices. Or do I, um, she often would not eat so that we could eat. It was that dire sometimes. And there's this new type of technology that allows millions more Americans to access solar, that allows them to access solar savings. So why wouldn't we make it easy for them to, to, to hear about and sign up for? That's our mission. So we're imagining an America that's filled with solar arrays, where you can get solar, doesn't matter what type of income you have, and it doesn't matter what type of rooftop you have, because fundamentally, how we were born or our life circumstances shouldn't mean that we are uh, eliminating options for ourselves to live a healthier life. So we're imagining America that's filled with solar arrays, and we, with Echo and Green's help, with all of our partners' help, we'll get there. So. Thank you. Thank you so much for that step up. Um, now invite, uh, so I might, I'll invite Chelsea to come up and um, get set up here so that we can start the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Oh. <laughs> 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 
You're like, ah! <laughs> Hey guys, so um, maybe we can explain how we got to work together. Yeah. I don't even know how we met. Craigslist? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Looking for help with solar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Chelsea runs the sustainability program, and they wanted, um, they were looking, interest, they got interested in community solar as a way to um, lower their own costs, but I think it goes beyond cost savings because we actually talked to dozens of corporations um, in our early days. And few, people are like, yeah, it, it sounds like a, community solar is this new thing. It sounds risky. I don't want to be the first person to do it. Uh, and so I would love for you to kind of explain why you were the first person to be interested in it. Well, um, yeah, I, I gravitate towards being the first person. <laughs> That's exciting for us, actually. Um, I guess that we have, when we, we set a goal in April of last year in 2016 to run our operations on 100% renewable electricity by 2020. Um, and when we were thinking about our strategy for our offices and our data centers, uh, we developed a framework that has five tenets of what type of renewable energy we're trying to source. And the first one is we want our, our dollars, our expenditure on the energy to drive impact. So we want to drive new renewable energy development, not just purchase RECs, renewable energy certificates, if you're familiar with those, which you can purchase on the market for very cheap. Um, we also wanted that uh, our effort to, to kind of really, uh, in terms of a long-term uh, perspective, to drive resiliency. So that meant that we wanted to site our renewable energy as close to our load as possible. Um, and of course, with community solar, it hits both of those. And the third thing we wanted to do was ensure that uh, um, our efforts don't negatively impact communities. And in some places in the world, renewable energy has a history of negatively impacting communities. So at the least, we didn't want to negatively impact, but we also wanted to see if we could use solar as a way to positively impact communities. Um, so that was another reason. Of course, there's the financial consideration as another one of our tenants, and uh, trying to be very transparent of how, about how we interact as another one of our, our tenants. But those first three, really, community solar checked all the boxes and nothing else did. So in New York, if you want to, New York City, if you want to run your large office building off of renewable energy, community solar or remote net metering are the closest you can get to your office unless you have a lot of roof space and then you can do a behind the meter array on your office. But the roof space we have is insignificant compared to yeah, the amount that Dumbo, we right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's about as big as this room. Maybe four times of this room. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we also a lot of a lot of um, tenants in New York don't own their buildings. So you lease and community solar is a great a great way of dealing with the issue of leasing. Yeah, but I'm so curious because corporate sustainability usually means it's oftentimes it's like about branding, right? Um, so <laughs> I'm intentionally being um, provocative because that's what it's often seen as, right? And so, and I think Etsy goes a step further than most corporations do in caring about these issues, and 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 sometimes you know when it affects the bottom line and and in a less straightforward way. You know, it's like sometimes there are costs or investments you have to make in order to be more sustainable, which a lot of corporations don't want to undertake. So what is it about, like, why is Etsy a leader in this when so many people are unwilling to? I mean, in terms of renewable energy procurement, I have to say, actually, that there's a lot of companies that are leading far beyond what we're doing. Um, so I want to acknowledge all the, the larger companies that have huge lows and are really able to procure renewables. Um, but I, I do think for, for smaller companies with smaller loads, it's very, very difficult. Um, and I guess it just it stems back to our strategy. Our strategy has always been to try to figure out how we can have a net positive impact on the world instead of just neutralizing our impact. Um, it's, it's very, on the social side, I think we get that. Etsy definitely um, empowers creative entrepreneurs around the world uh, to do what they love and care about. Um, on the environmental side, it's, it's Hard, it's really hard to have a net positive impact when you have operations. Um, so we're, we're still just trying to get to neutral. So um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think the reason why we're focusing so much on it is we, we see beyond the neutral, though. We really, we really want to go to that positive place. Mm -hmm. 
And one cool thing that Etsy um, was really interested in doing, and particularly Chelsea, was kind of low income access. So we work on um, increasing access to low to moderate income uh, Americans as well. And so even though community solar is touted to be this perfect solution for letting everyone access solar, it's not actually quite there yet. Uh, and it's not there yet for two reasons. So one is people have to have a 700 FICO score to sign up for community solar right now. And like I can't even sign up because <laughs> some, <laughs> some <laughs> indiscretions in college. <laughs> um, so that's crazy, right? But like think about it. Um, you can have a $500,000 mortgage and be in debt and you will have a higher FICO score than a renter who pays their utility bill on time, the rental payment bill on time, because that's how FICO works. FICO doesn't measure a lot of these things that only renters undertake. Uh, and then the second reason why low to moderate income Americans can't get uh, community solar is they have to sign up for a 20-year contract right now. So, wait, like everyone's like, ugh. <laughs> running out. Uh, the, and I think that's hilarious because some people don't even sign up for marriage for 20 years these days. <laughs> 20 years is a really long time. And so signing up for electricity for 20 years is, is a big ask, right? Especially people, a lot, I think most people in this room are on the younger side and that's not on their radar. Like you're, you're, you're going to move, statistically, you move 11 times in your life. Um, and so you're probably judging grossly judging everyone's age in this room, probably going to move um, seven to nine more times in your life. So that those are huge obstacles. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you, we've talked about some solutions to that. Would you, you want to talk? Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of sellers that I think on our platform that are in exactly that position where uh, their income is based on, you know, selling jewelry or clothes or crafts. They don't have a huge disposable income. Um, so... We, we, when we think about how we engage in these, these uh, initiatives, we also always put ourselves in the shoes of our sellers. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, it, it's, a, it's a big problem. Um, one thing that we've talked about doing and we haven't done, um, and I would love to see another company out there take this on, is use philanthropic dollars as more or less a guarantee fund for their community. Um, in, in terms of accessing community solar and making sure that uh, that that fund uh, doesn't uh, allows people to access the the community solar with a lower FICO score, yeah. and and also using our leverage as a company to say if we're going to work with you as a developer, you need to have shorter terms. Like we cannot ask anyone to sign up to a twenty year term. That's crazy. So I think I've actually talking to to developer different developers there. They're sensitive to that, and they like they get that. Um, I think it's just about bankability of the project, right? Like, yeah, yeah. So however, we can find a way around that. What do you think? Well, to to provide people context, like why twenty years is that seems to totally arbitrary. The they're just using going off the traditional financing of rooftop solar arrays. So with rooftop solar, you don't want you want to prevent default because if someone defaults and you're stuck with a stranded asset on someone's roof, you can't get back. But the reason why it doesn't really make sense for community solar because you're not dealing with the same amount of risk. In New York, you can swap someone out of their community solar share every month. So you're allowed to just kick them out if they're not paying their bill every month. So the default rate is um, we can predict. And then the impact, the number of months that you're without cash flows, you can also predict. And it's much less than 20 years. So it's, it's about, I think it's about risk. Right, like they're all. This is a new industry. Um, everyone's used to doing things a certain way, and no one wants to take the risk. And so we we spent two years trying to push people to take the risk on normative terms. We said, this is the right thing to do because you should do it because you should expand access. Like, but then we realized that was our limited framework. Right, like that's our language as liberals who are socially impact driven, I'm environmentalist, like that's how we talk to each other and that that's like falls on deaf ears otherwise. Um, and so using data has been our new tactic and it's now starting to work where we say, these are 1400 people on our wait list for community solar and 60% of them refuse to sign a 20 year contract. And these, this is, these, these are customers you could have today if you offered a short-term contract. And so we'll be piloting one later this year, oh, which is really exciting. But, um, but it, it, 
like that is you have to figure out I guess what convinces people yeah. because ri no one wants to take the risk. What's the contract term that you're piloting? I mean, it's still it's only five years, right? And so we could be doing better. It should be it should be one year. Mm -hmm. It should be less than one year. Yeah. Um, because you don't have to sign up for a contract for your utility now, yeah. right? Yeah. And this is less than your utility bill. You're paying less. So if you're going to pay your utility bill, you'll probably pay your community solar bill. Yeah. So, is there a cancellation penalty on that five year? Uh, we haven't discussed that aspect yet. <laughs> Sorry. <about> yeah. We don't have to be asking these questions. Yeah. This is actually a real conversation. <laughs> so, uh, oh, so here's another aspect of community solar products and why we have to push them to be better is that sometimes there's no cancellation fee. So the 20 year contract doesn't actually have teeth. There's one developer that we work with that, that has a $1,200 cancellation fee. Right. And so the average family. Saving two hundred dollars every year with community solar, and that's that would have been a lot to my family, but it's not a lot when you look at it, things on a daily or monthly basis. And so, if you're charging someone twelve hundred dollars to can't get out of their their contract, then they have to be with your contract for six years to break even, right? These are these make it hard for people to sign up, and so part of what we do is is um, like you know raise philanthropic funds to mitigate the risk of including low to moderate income Americans. That's great. I think even if there's no cancellation fee, just having anything that anyone has to sign for 20 years is just makes it in their mind out, out the window. Yeah. We have a program for rooftop solar for our sellers called Etsy Solar, where we've partnered with um, a national developer to give discounts to our sellers for going solar at home on the roof. And I just see so many barriers to them going solar. And a lot of it is is really just the, the fear and the uncertainty of the unknown. And I think community solar can can really take over the space of rooftop solar if it can get rid of all of those barriers. Yeah. It sounds like you're, I mean, I know you're doing a great job on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's fast. I think, like, the fact that Etsy, I want to go back to how cool Etsy is, but you, you're helping your your sellers on your marketplace um, sell like buy solar for their home, right? I can't imagine eBay would have offered that benefit and perk to their sellers, right? Like Craigslist would not. <laughs> so why why do that? Why offer solar well, perks? We also well because we care. <laughs> Um, and then as a part of driving our sustainability strategy, we realized we needed to make public commitments to the world to hold ourselves accountable. So we made a public commitment along at the same time as the renewable energy one to aspire to run a carbon neutral marketplace. So the Etsy solar program is a part of that, really looking into our supply chain and seeing how we can ensure that our, our whole marketplace is carbon neutral. We have a long ways to go. We have to figure out the shipping problem. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that's why. Well, wow. it's cool because uh, you think of workplace sustainability as lights in the office and what temperature the rooms are at, but this is redefining it to include people from workplace all the way to their home, yeah. which is, I think, a step beyond, I think, what other people do. It's, it's really the most material impact that we can have. I mean, our offices and our data centers definitely have an impact in the world, but uh, the biggest impact we can have is to help our sellers yeah. learn out at home how they can learn their studios, how they can be more sustainable. Yeah. And I want to also open up, you know, the opportunity for other folks to ask questions and make it... I have, can I have, ask one more quick question? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought that everyone might be might benefit to know from where community solar is a viable option in the U.S. Mm. Yeah, that's a good, good point. So there's growing. 16 states that have laws that allow for community solar, which means that there's been a state, uh, the state legislature has said you can benefit from solar that's not on your own rooftop. So it can be far away, not connected to your home. And the states that have the most progressed uh, legislation, I mean, in markets for this, are Massachusetts, Colorado, um, and Minnesota. And then recently, uh, the biggest markets have been New York, Maryland just became a community solar state, will be big, Rhode Island, uh, Illinois just became a community solar state, and California has laws for it too. So every year, one or two states become community solar states, which is why that Department of Energy says that we they think it's going to be a $16 billion industry in a few years. So 
even if the the law's not there, the utility in any other state across the country can decide they want to build community solar. So Georgia doesn't have a community solar law, but the Georgia utility is building community solar. Um, South Carolina, same thing. So super cool way to get more of these projects on the ground. But these projects get on the ground because people demand that they get on the ground. Like Again, creating the demand allows these projects to get, be built, which is why it's so important to, to be able to rally communities around it and for people to want to bring it back to their own communities. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a question. So if you're living in an apartment community um, where they say we can only accept, uh, say, content, for example, how do you get around that problem introducing a potential you know, vendor to your, your landlord? So, oh, I see what you're saying. So actually, if you mean your landlord is paying the electricity bill? Um, yes, or in some cases, your building management um, office is only accepting for you to sign up with a certain company for your utility. Yeah, so the great thing about community solar is you don't have to break your relationship with the utility. So what happens is you say, how do you pronounce your name? Labina. Labina. Yeah. So Labina, you sign up for a solar, a solar share, and we go to, the, as Solstice, we go to your utility, uh, Con Ed, and we say, hey, Labina has signed up for a solar share. Her usage is about 10 panels. She'll take 10 panels worth. So you have to credit her with the electricity produced by her 10 panels on her utility bill every month. So what you see on your Con Ed bill is you see a credit that shows up and you basically essentially will zero out your electricity bill. And for that credit, you pay us 90 cents for every dollar you would have given to Con Ed. So instead of the dollar you would have given to Con Ed for that amount of electricity, you're now paying 90 cents for a solar credit to show up on your bill. Does that make sense? So the actual electrons are not going from the farm to your home, like in um, through the tubes. <laughs> uh, but because you because you're a subscriber to this farm, you're allowed for it to be built. So you're you're putting some more solar in the ground. It's like a pool of water. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So in that case, if you're moving within New York City, so if you're moving from one road to the other or something. Can, and, uh, but you're retaining your electricity provider. Mm -hmm. Can you still keep the subscription with that? Generally, yeah. So you, you have to basically be in the same utility zone as your solar farm. And in Massachusetts, that zone can be dozens of miles away. We just worked on a project in the greater Boston area that was 20 miles outside of greater Boston. I mean, Boston, but could serve Boston. So they can be far. What we found is people get real excited when it's in their town, though. This, this particular farm could have been offered to all of Boston, but the people in the small town of Dover, Massachusetts, bought it up because they were like, oh my god, you turn this landfill into a solar farm? That's so cool. And then they bought it. In New York City, it's Zone J, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that would be the five boroughs in Westchester. Yeah. You yeah. can move anywhere and you'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question, like, so uh, it's affected by sunlight, right? So, I mean, so are you paying, if it's a subscription model, like, let's say I pay you uh, whatever amount each month, right? Mm -hmm. um, but does the sunlight, like, change the amount of sunlight that the solar farms get every month change? And then does that affect how much? It's like, it's like a day? particularly <laughs> cloudy day today. <laughs> yeah, right? And so would that affect, instead yeah. of me getting, like, the full the bill paid off, right? Like, is it some months, like, 50% of it is paid off, mm -hmm. and some months, like, 75%? Um, and then, like, what exactly is... You know, like the business model in terms of why would Con Edison do this instead of like me paying Con Edison one dollar, right? Yeah. Um, why would and then I'm paying you ninety cents, mm -hmm. but where does Con Edison get paid? You're very at, sharp. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Like in a sense, like you're a broker, you're a, you're a solar broker. Right? Yeah. So as a solar broker, I mean that's one way to put it. So Con Edison, like they need an incentive for you to basically like take more of their pot. Yeah, so you touched on, to, to take your second question first, and I'd yeah. love to hear your perspective too. You touched on the exactly the reason why utilities hate solar. Yeah. And it's not just community solar, but they have a special passion for community solar because it's more accessible to more people. But the more people who go solar, the less revenue utilities get. Right? They call this the utility death spiral. Is that, That's actually what they call it. Um, and that, that means that they actually lobby and legislate uh, legislators to not pass solar friendly legislation. So if you look at the map for community solar across the country, you're like, hmm, 
those are some cloudy ass states. <laughs> and <laughs> we're like Minnesota, Massachusetts, uh, and not all the sunny ones on the bottom. And um, it's, it's partly political, but uh, what pe why the people call it a utility death spiral is because the assumption is like, this is the future. This is the way the economy is going. Renewable energy will not go away. And so what people are increasingly saying is you utilities should get involved in the development game. Don't just like watch your customers leave. Go develop renewable energy yourself. And there's starting to be these progressive utilities that are doing it. Utility-led community solar is becoming more and more uh, a big part of the pie. And then the other, th why do they do it today? One, because they're forced to by law. Two, um, the more compelling reason is because you know, New York and a lot of the states across the country have these requirements that you have to have some portion of your electricity come from, from renewable sources by a certain date. Um, and they're always ambitious goals. And if they miss those goals, getting some of their power from renewable sources, then they have to pay fines. So they, there's in some ways this um, already built in demand for the renewable energy that's, that's built. Um, I would also add, I mean, the difference between regulated and deregulated energy states. So in New York, Con Edison is, is your supplier of energy. They like they I'm oh, sorry, not your supplier, you, like they deliver the energy to you, they maintain the grid, they make sure that there's no major congestion, right? They make manage congestion, right? Yeah. Um, but you are required to have a supplier of energy that's different. Con Ed is actually not even allowed to to develop energy according to the Public Services mm -hmm. Commission right now. So um, you could sign up with Con Edison Sol Solutions, which is a separate company to your supplier. But you could also, um, like, you can choose any supplier in New York State. So in some cases with community solar, it's kind of just like a separate supplier. I know it's not exactly mm -hmm. that way, but Con Ed is still the one that's that's their supplier. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I saw someone in the back get mad about that comment. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that what Chelsea said: the delivery charges where utilities make their profit. Yeah. They don't make a profit on how much electrons flow through their wires, mm -hmm. but they make a return on the wires that they have hanging on the street and the yeah. pipes in the ground and stuff like that. So the death spiral that Seth was referring to is that um, if they don't have as many customers all taking the same amount of, giving them the same amount of money, mm -hmm. they have to spread out their profit across fewer customers. And it gets more expensive for customers and they leave to other providers. So it's like, it makes it much harder. But this kind of is still in the infrastructure, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's where, like, even if we go down this death spiral, in a sense, like, they're gonna only be able to make money on the infrastructure. Which, well, which, which I think yeah. for community solar aggregators on the demand side yeah. and developers on the putting solar panels up side, like, everyone kind of wants the same thing. Yeah. They're just the laws and the regulations aren't speaking the same language yet. Yeah. But it's, it should develop into a nice thing. Uh, I love the demand driven model. Uh, I guess I'm just curious for a developer who wants to, you know, believe that your customers are there and they're going to commit to, you know, buying that solar power. What is the uh, contract that you make uh, with those 1,400 people that you gave an example as uh, that they're actually going to stay uh, with you and committed to wanting to buy that solar? Because once you have them, it still takes a developer a year or two, maybe even, mm -hmm. you know, three years to actually, you know, get all of in place, constructed, and interconnected. So uh, how does that work from you know, getting those customers to keeping them there, you know, committed to wanting to buy that power? Yeah, I mean, part of it is we try to decrease the time, the, it, the interconnection time. So rather than it being three years, uh, we, we're hoping for more four to six months. Uh, and then part of it is, you know, I guess why even go with Solstice, right? Like they're, they're increasingly, when we started, there were less than five providers of community solar in this country, and they all built solar. They didn't do the customer interfacing that we did. Um, and now there are quite literally hundreds in the country. And I think part of what we try to do differently is we're just the honest broker. We're trying to get you the best deal. We're very customer facing. We're not, we don't work with uh, developers that offer predatory contracts. We don't, uh, a lot of contracts out there are predatory. And we try to make it more transparent so that people um, can have the choice to just choose the best plan that's for them. So when they sign up on our wait list, they're not signing up for a particular product. They put what their preference is, but just so we can show customer data about what people want. But they're essentially saying, like, I trust you to be my honest broker to find the best deal for me in my area. So in, in 
the grand scheme of things, how how much potential does solar and community solar specifically, but solar in general, have to meet the energy demand of the country? Yeah. Can someone guess uh, who how much of our electricity right now comes from solar? U.S. Less than 1%. Less than 1%. And they're hoping by 2020 it'll be 5%, right? And actually we have a lot, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, more of a power that comes from different wind and other kinds of renewable energy sources, but it's really small right now. Yet solar is the one uh, renewable energy source that you could, you could make an argument can be done anywhere. Anywhere you could, you could have solar. So that what this model is is really kind of the sharing economy, right? You're taking resources and using them more efficiently and allowing people access to them that don't have access to them. And so there's no way we're going to solve climate change unless we democratize access to renewable energy. And solar is the easiest way to do that given the sun is plentiful and it's always there. Um, and so that's, you know, we're so far behind where we should be. But this is one way we can do better. And more, and I want to like pause and say we can make it more equitable, right? Like, who are the people that have solar now? Rich homeowners, generally, and like um, they're not the people that need solar savings the most. They're not the people that w are are um, that they're not the people that create the most emissions either, right? Those the people who are most affected by climate change are the least likely to get clean energy in this world. And so this is a model that can in introduce more equity into this green economy. So that's promising. There's never been like a community wins type program. Mm -hmm. like there's solar light and literally get six panels. Yeah. What, do you ask if there has is been? Is there like community wins? There yeah. Is, yeah. Like, You've worked with. Um, yeah, there, I know there's one of the, a startup in the U.S. based actually in Dumbo, and I forgot the name of it. Um, they're working on community wind projects in upstate New York. Um, I think it's a little bit harder of a sell than solar, uh, ultimately. Why is that? Because um, solar can really go anywhere. Wind, wind requires a, a lot longer development lead time, monitoring and measuring. It's Usually you want a very large wind farm in order for it to make a lot of sense. So you're talking, um, you know, 100 megawatts and delivering that all to small homeowners can be maybe a little bit more difficult. The community wind group that I know is doing small scale wind. They're not doing large scale wind. I'm not an expert in this field at all. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe you shouldn't take anything I just said. You, it's like you have something to say. Oh, I have a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and then another community wind project is something that I'm actually on the board of. Uh, we are working in uh, Oaxaca, Mexico, um, in Ixtepec, where the wind resource is the second largest wind resource in the world, to work to help communities, indigenous communities, own and run wind, utility scale wind projects, and the profits all go back into community development, not into individual profits. So there are models that we're actively trying to prove. Um, I was just wondering, in terms of the solar can go anywhere, um, I still don't have a good understanding of like if there is a, oh, that question, a I mean, amount of yeah, yeah. cloud cover, mm -hmm. um, is there, like how does that um, Produce like the same amount of energy as yeah. We get asked this question a lot because we're based in Boston. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, there is you can actually so G Germany is a good example, right? Yeah. Germany is very cloudy. It doesn't have a ton of sun radiance when you compare it to Texas, but yeah. it is the biggest uh, solar country in the world, right? And so part of that is you'd be surprised. You don't need that much as much sun as you would think to get your power from solar. But the other part of it is that, um, to answer your, your original, your first question, is you're always going to pay 90 cents to the dollar of what you would have paid the utility for whatever your solar share produces. So if it, do it doesn't produce as much, you just won't save as much as you wanted. But that doesn't mean you're going to ever pay more with community or um, the, the community solar products we work on, and it doesn't mean that like you're 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 not going to produce anything. So you're going to produce something, but it might be not your full bill. But you're still going to save for every dollar you would have paid the utility. You're going to pay ninety cents. So yes, there are cloudier parts of the country, 
but you still can in Boston. You still can cover your, your house's usage, and I think that says a lot. <laughs> Yeah, and it's also seasonal, right? Like in the summer, so what, what's cool about these regulations is that if you produce more solar than you need that, that, that month for community solar, you can carry your credits over to the next month. And so, yes, in winter you will produce less because it's cloudier and there's snow, but in summer you can produce more than you need, and so those credits even out over the course of the year. Yeah. I've got a two-part question. Uh, one, in a community solar development, who owns the green attributes? Mm -hmm. power mm -hmm. And then secondly, maybe if the residents or if people don't, off takers don't really care about them as much, could corporate step in or philanthropists who want the green attributes to provide like backstop financing of some sort in exchange for the green attributes? And then and how are you guys doing it in your development? If I got that right. And what are green attributes? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a fancy word for money. No. <laughs> you want to explain what green attributes are? Harris. Harris, I think Harris works in this industry. Yeah. <laughs> I used to work at a utility company. Uh, green attributes, someone can correct if I get this wrong, but it's uh, like when you uh, when you produce an electron from a solar panel, it, they measure the electron, and there's this green attribute they put next to it. A rec. And a rec, a renewable energy credit. Certificate. Certificate, thank you. <laughs> and so someone can buy that certificate from you because you produced it if you own it, if you own the offtake of it, and it's usually worth a penny or two pennies or... In New Jersey, it could be two hundred and twenty dollars. You see, it's gone up to five hundred. Okay. So for every one kilowatt hour of electricity that's produced, you are, sorry, megawatt hour. <laughs> That'd be adorable. <laughs> That'd be so great. For every one megawatt hour of electricity that's produced by a, a, a you know a, a generating um, entity, then you get a re renewable energy certificate, and then you can, in some states, you can trade that renewable energy certificate in an auction. And so it increases the value of the farm. It, it de decreases the installation cost because you have this added re revenue. So generally, the people who have these recs are the people who own the farm. And in, the, in community solar, you have very few ownership models um, for reasons I can get to if, if anyone is interested in SEC regulations. <laughs> but you have more subscription models because they're easier to scale. And subscription is people are not owning their 10 panels that are allocated to them they are subscribing to them. And the people who own the farm are the people who built the farm and finance the farm. And that's a combination of solar developers and solar financiers and their tax equity financiers. Um, and so that's to say that they own the RECs right now. Um, but to your, get your question about could corporates want to buy the RECs or get involved and, and thus um, help with the financing of the solar farm, it's a question for you. Yeah, it's absolutely a great question. Um, it really depends on the state. So, for instance, in New York, uh, NYSERDA currently claims all the all the SRECs. Um, so there's really little that, as a corporate off-taker, we could do with those SRECs. Or we, we can't. But they're talking about changing that. Um, and then in New Jersey, for instance, there's no way that I could convince our leadership to pay $240 uh, SREC um, or whatever it is currently. Um, it just, it wouldn't be, that's really, at, the, at that high of a price, it has to be something that I think is mandate, like the utility pays because of state mandates. Um, but when it's a, a price that's more, um, like, uh, I don't know, 10 to $20 range, that's a range where I think corporate off-takers could potentially start playing a role. I mean, they'd probably prefer lower than that, but a role in actually uh, helping projects get off the ground because of retaining RECs. The problem is most corporations that use a REC purchasing strategy will purchase Texas Wind RECs for, I don't know, 40 cents. So why would they purchase a REC from a community solar farm when they could purchase a Texas REC? Um, for next to nothing. I would never encourage Etsy to do that because every developer I talk to says that those recs from Texas don't drive renewable energy development. There's no impact. So why would you even spend money on something that doesn't drive impact? Um, but yeah, I, I think if the price, the price range is right, I think it's a good corporate strategy. And it's, it would be great because you can also help your supply chain or help your community. So you could be purchasing the recs from a community solar array that you've offered to your community, which would be an ideal situation. Just letting you know, we have uh, time for one more question, but there's uh, plenty of time after this to just making sure that we get people that need to head out, need to head out. We will be sticking around for more, so one more question. Um, 
So I'm gathering that your customer base is kind of split in between two buckets. So you have like corporations and then like residential community members or people in neighborhoods. So can you provide a little insight about the different barriers to entry for those two groups and kind of what their different considerations or cautions might be when they're trying to um, build a plan with you guys? Yeah, I would also um, offer the another group is just community organizations. We sign up a lot of churches and, and then the congregations will sign up as well for their homes. So the idea is have, and you know, in some ways, in some ways, a corporation is a community organization and can be at its um, best manifestation. And so, <laughs> like Etsy. <laughs> um, and, and so there's, the, I mean, uh, there's obstacles that we discussed earlier about low to moderate income access, right? Long, longer term contracts and high FICO scores are um, a real barrier for individuals. We got a Department of Energy grant to find alternative metrics to qualify customers for solar in general. And so we're, we, um, we're getting outside the FICO game. We think FICO is a dumb proxy for figuring out whether someone should get solar. We're using utility repayment history, rental payment histories, um, and collecting data across the country. And I uh, have a lab at MIT that's kind of crunching the numbers and figuring out what's a better way to qualify people. And then on an organizational level, there's also um, just regulatory hurdles with anything clean energy. So projects in New York were supposed to get online in quarter one of this year, maybe even end of last year, and they're still not online because of a question around how much the value of the electricity is in New York. So it's a long de debate. They're closing the debate soon. And so projects will come online. But it's just there are these delays that you don't anticipate. And so to someone's earlier point about how do you, you sign someone up, you want to keep them, you know, you want to get them interested and keep them warm, even if they have to wait a while. But you, you also have to work with the government to make sure that we're, we do a lot of policy and advocacy ourselves to decrease the amount of time people are waiting. Yeah, and before you wrap up, could you just maybe let the room know like, if there's one or two things that we can do to support you, what would you <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you can you can tell who works at Echoing Green. <laughs> Thanks for that softball. Um, there, I appreciate that question. There, I mean, there is I, what I mentioned before is someone asked why aren't utility like why are utilities not embracing community solar? Well, why aren't there more states with community solar legislation? And a part of it, I think, is that we're, we don't have a clean energy constituency in this country. We don't have people. Um, that benefit from clean energy at a wide, broad scale because it's really only available to a few of us. And so until we make clean energy work for all of us and not just some of us, we're never going to get past all of these um, environmental problems we have. And so what I would say is if there's a call to action, think about bringing community solar to your community. And that's, or do you know a landowner that could site a farm? Because land is obviously really scarce in New York. And, um, and that's the biggest problem why no not more projects haven't gotten up in New York City. It's because it's just land scarcity. Do you know um, a, a community organization that once we get these projects going in New York that would want to bring their entire network to be to sign up? And if you do, you know our website is solstice.us, so solstice.us, and there's a Go Solar page, and if you fill out that form, like, and tell us you want to bring solar to your community, you want, you know someone who ha could site a solar farm. Those are ways that we can work together to, to make sure there's more solar in this world. How much space are we talking about? So, a lot. Um, you, can, you can, so the smaller the farm, the more expensive it is to build, because you don't get the economies of scale of building bigger farms and having fewer um, like inverters and things like that. And so you can aggregate rooftops across the city, but each individual array will be more expensive to build. So like, you know the owner of Chelsea Piers, that, that would be awesome. <laughs> but uh, a warehouse rooftop really, right? Yeah, yeah. warehouse rooftop. Um, you, can, you can do pilot projects on smaller rooftops, but think of warehouse rooftop. So to give you an idea, a couple of football fields array will serve about 150 people. So you need, you need a lot of space. Thanks so much for coming, guys. Really appreciate it. <laughs>